We called him the Screaming Man. I don't know if he is alive or dead, though he was probably moved into Eastborough State Hospital once the old woman passed away. He may still be a patient, and I plan to find out. Find out if they've medicated him into passivity, or if he still rants and laughs. If he is an inmate, I'll visit his room, and sneak in a knife to scrape off some of the paint on his wall. An elderly woman lived in the small house by the head of our driveway, and she cared for several disturbed people in her home over the years, an assortment who came and went. There was a hulking, huge bearded man, ever silent, who took walks in the neighbourhood. I didn't care to have him trailing, even distantly behind me when I walked uptown to buy a jug of milk for my parents. There was the shriveled little mummy of a woman, her face lined beyond what seemed natural, who would stand at the head of our driveway and watch me while I walked my dog in the yard. There was a youngish man with banged blonde hair, who also wandered about town occasionally. One time, when I entered my back hall to take my dog out, I was startled to see this man's face at the window of the outer door, staring into our back hall. He turned, upon seeing me, and trudged up the driveway back to our home. But the screaming man unnerved me most of all. Sometimes I thought that he was never let out of the house, not even out of his room. I imagined him chained by the leg to his bed. And yet, would that afflicted a soul be permitted to live with an elderly woman? Other times, and this was more frightening in a way, I believed he was actually that huge hulking man, so very quiet when drifting about town by day, and so bedeviled by night. The screaming man's silhouette in the second-floor windows was, after all, bulky. I would peek out my parents' kitchen window and watch his silhouette against the shades of his room. He would be pacing and flailing his thick arms wildly in the air, roaring as if in outrage, frustration, and then other times laughing in a way that I could only feel was calculated to disturb, unsettle his neighbours. My family, in particular, I came to believe, perhaps only out of fearful paranoia. But did he see me peeking nightly around my shade at his windows? Was he peeking around his shades at me when his lights were out? I can still remember his abrupt, booming, deliberate laugh. Ha! 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 Each part of it unnaturally spaced out, those spaces between more chilling than the sudden barking sound itself. When the old woman died, the miniature sanitarium was emptied of both her belongings and her inmates. I remember my father somehow acquired a few of her things, and offered to me a pair of tacky Japanese fans. I declined them, horrified at what diseased energies might have soaked into them. And yet, when my father told me how little the small house was going for, now it was on the market, my negative feelings towards it began to change. By this time, I lived in my own apartment across town, a sterile few rooms, depressing as a cell in themselves. My credit was good, and I was engaged, and my fiancé and I decided to take advantage of this opportunity quickly, before someone else acted on it. He was close to my family emotionally, and it didn't seem to mind the prospect of being so close to them physically. I bought the house. It would be tough, but if I could handle it alone until that June, my new husband would be living with me and adding his income to my own. Our wedding would be modest, but it was worth the sacrifice, not having to live in a slightly larger version of that sterile cell I occupied. To save more money, we took to doing most of the renovations in the house ourselves. The simpler things, at least, some plumbing and electrical matters were beyond my abilities, but Liam and I painted the outside of the small house and stripped the age-darkened, water-stained wallpaper inside to paint the walls instead. I was alone when I began to strip the wallpaper from the upstairs bedroom. Liam was at work that afternoon, I had called in sick with one of my frequent agonising headaches, but I had become restless watching TV downstairs and thought I might at least make the day productive in some small way. 
and I had been relishing the thought of tearing away that room's particularly ugly paper, jagged swirling paisley designs like an orgy of psychedelic tadpoles. Instantly something seemed amiss, as my blade tore through the discoloured paper and seemed to skid upwards almost out of my control. The action caused my entire hand to slip under the paper, as if into the belly of some beast I was flaying. I took hold of the flap of old paper, and tore a large strip of it free from the wall. Beneath it, the wall had an odd character. It was dark, smooth where the blade had scraped away what little dry paste still remained. It was not plaster beneath, but some slab of metal or glass that had been papered over many years before. I used my tool again to dig under more of the paper, and clear more of the crumbling residue of paste. I peeled off more long strips by hand. I expected to find that the smooth slab comprised only a limited section of the wall. Instead, as more and more of the wall was cleared, I came to realize that this entire wall, running the entire length of the room, was made of that smooth, dark material. And now I had decided that it was, in fact, glass a great single sheet of it, of a deep red colour so dark that at first I mistook it for black. But there was a distant light glowing behind the glass wall. Not the glow of an electric light, but of sky. As I cleared more and more of the paper and paste away, incredibly I saw the glow grow softly bigger, until I realised that what I was seeing behind the glass wall was the coming of dawn. Even as outside the windows of the room, Night was falling. I nearly stumbled downstairs, ran around to the side of the house, staring up at where that wall would be situated. But there were no windows in that length of the wall to let in light from street lamps or elsewhere that I might be mistaking for a dawning glow. Solid wooden slats, freshly painted by Liam and myself. I returned to the house, putting on every light along my way. The steps of the gloomy staircase creaked. Entering the bedroom, I put on the lights, but they reflected in a glare on the glass surface. When I put them out, I could see that the glow was ever strengthening, streaking a sky free of the tree and rooftops of Eastborough. Gingerly, reluctantly, I went to the wall, cupped my hands around my face and pressed it against the cool surface. It was a barren terrain beyond, not desert, but blasted, strewn with rubble, twisted wire and jagged metal, as if an atomic blast had levelled a city, to just the rubble of rubble. Here and there a thorny bit of scrub wavered almost imperceptibly in the faint breeze. A dead leaf from some unseen tree would tumble lazily along in the air, black against the gashes of red cloud. Everything red, as if I gazed through an aquarium window into an ocean of blood. And then I realized that it was an ocean. The leaves tumbling before the desolate vista were not blown on a breeze, but floating along in deep, nearly still waters, the scrub swaying in a gentle undertow. But then, what was that light spreading from the horizon, rather than coming from above? I backed away from the spectacle, so that again all I could really make out was the crimson strata of clouds, the landscape again lost in gloom. I backed into the opposite wall, and then I jumped away from it, whirled around as if it might engulf me, my bladed implement held like a knife before me, electricity buzzing through my body, surging in my guts. I advanced on this other wall and dug my blade under the paper there too. But beneath the paper on this wall was only white plaster. I discovered the same was true of the other walls. The miracle was confined to just one wall of the bedroom of the screaming man. The windows of his room were now black, but the wall of red glass, it was now so luminous with dawn's light that I could make out the silhouettes of ruin and debris and eerily waving vegetation even from across the room. And further, I now began to detect other distant shapes silhouetted against the red horizon. I floated to the wall. As I neared it, I saw its red glow on my shirt front, on my hands. 
the glow now softly illuminated the entire room. I was terrified to press my face to the glass again. I was in a state like shock, like a waking faint. The fear in my belly was so great that I had to gag back a wretch of nausea. My parents were in the next house and I wanted to run to them. But I was so in awe of the red glass wall that I was too frightened to turn my back on it. And I felt almost a masochistic compulsion to find out what those new shapes were emerging from the glass. I returned my face to the glass, again cupped my hands around it. They were floating a bit off the blasted floor of rubble, carried on some slow current or tide. Dark forms, upright, without limbs. They were leaf-shaped, and so terribly still as the current drew them nearer and nearer nearer to the red glass wall. Again I backed away. This time I lunged out into the hall, descended several steps, gripping the creaking banister for support, as if it were the railing of a platform miles above some seething volcanic pit. I must call Liam, who would be home from work by now, beg him to come over here. I couldn't bear this alone, and if I was insane, then I had to know that. I desperately hoped I was not sane. And yet I was too stricken to move. I was too afraid to step outside into the dark of night to descend the driveway of my parents' house. Even that short distance was now a gulf of impossible mystery, with all the unknown cosmos yawning infinitely above. For a while I remained totally paralysed, my sense of reality so decimated that a single step might hurl me into some whirling vortex. At last I turned and gazed back at the open doorway to the bedroom. The red light glowed on the mildewed wallpaper of the hall landing. It beckoned me. Slowly I ascended one step. Another. I stepped into the bedroom of the screaming man. But I froze in the threshold, as if I had been caught in a powerful electric charge. My hands seized the door frame and the air hissed out of my throat and I was suddenly so terrified that it was as though I had simply been mildly anxious before. So terrified that tears literally rolled from my eyes and I heard my own voice whimpering like that of a child awakened from a nightmare, and too afraid to call out for her parents. But I had not awakened from a nightmare, but into one. The infernal alien landscape was hidden now behind a wall of figures crowded up against the glass, living figures mashing their flesh against its surface so that it was bent and flattened horribly. There were so many of these figures that they stretched off to the formerly barren horizon, a sea of them at the bottom of this red sea, pressed together, unmoving, thousands if not millions, and all gazing through the glass wall at me. They had no limbs, their bodies elliptical and red, glistening with rows of ribs showing starkly under the thinnest sheath of skin. They looked like half-dissected things, prehistoric invertebrates. I am put in mind of the planarian, and I wish I could believe that they were that primitive, but those silent, glaring faces. Blank, hardly human, barely even animal. Empty as they were, they conveyed a malign, unmistakable intelligence. And worst of all, of course, the eyes. Because their eyes glowed, glowed white somehow, even through the deep red tint of the heavy glass wall. The white-hot gaze of those unmoving multitudes upon me, pinning me, and yet enticing me to come closer to the wall to pick up the hammer from my toolbox, to swing the hammer against the glass. I don't know if the screaming man had been driven mad because he had somehow, consciously or not, summoned these things, opened this window, unseen by him behind the paper, but those gazes felt upon him, or if the window had opened and those things had gathered as a result of his existing madness. But I hope to find him now. I hope to ask him what he knows. I feel he's here in this complex with me somewhere. I have all the time in the world to find him. 
They think me crazy, you see, because they don't understand why I would have burned my new house to the ground. And there is no proof, because my tactics were successful. I destroyed that strange portal with cleansing fire. No one found a trace of it in the charred ruins of my new house. Just timbers and empty window frames. I'll find the screaming man, and I'll dig at the wall of his room to see if he has attracted those hungry beings again. And if he has, I will have to kill him, so that he does not let them into our world. And then, of course, I shall kill myself as well, for they have tasted my fear now, and have been drawn to it. They have both created and hungered for my own madness. <laughs>